Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Klaas van der Tempel. Um, I'm from Studium Generale, which is TU Delft's platform for lecture and discussion. Uh, some of you, I think, I recognize a lot of these names. Some of you are joining us from the keynote lecture, which uh, just finished half an hour ago, uh, of today's symposium, which is the Day of Sustainability. Others, you're new, and that's also perfectly fine. Um, you missed the keynote, but today is a standalone lecture, so you uh, haven't missed anything important for today's purposes. Uh, right now, actually, there are five parallel lectures going on. Uh, you chose to join this one, so thank you for that. Awesome to have you. Uh, most of these other lectures that are happening right now as part of the symposium are very more, more tech-related and um, business-oriented. We're going to take a different tack today. Uh, our lecture, as you know, is called Non-Western Narratives and Experiences with uh, Climate Change. And we're going to go off the beaten path in terms of what we're used to in Delft. We're going to step away from tech solutionism related to climate change and uh, Western style thinking about how to orient ourselves to global problems. Um, and we're going to look at cultures, peoples, and societies around the world who are actually marginalized, marginalized by our own technology, our economy, and our cultural practices. So for this purposes, we have invited Antoine Dill, who is a chemical engineer. He's a former director of NINSE, which if I remember the translation in English correct, is the, uh, the Dutch of the National Institute uh, for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its Legacy. Also recently, also recently the founder of Nature's Narratives, which is how I came across Anton, a very interesting platform, um, which gives a voice to peoples and cultures that are most impacted by our economy, like I just said. So we have about 40 minutes for this lecture. It's very short. I'm sure Anton has a lot to tell us, and you probably have questions as well, which you'll have a chance to ask at the end. Uh, this lecture is being recorded, so if there's anything that you missed or if you want to share this later with your friends, it's going to be on YouTube, uh, on SG's YouTube channel. Um, if you are comfortable with asking questions at the end, you know, just, you know, raise your hand or something and I will unmute your mic so you can ask Antoine your question directly and otherwise just put it in the chat and I will ask the question for you. So, without further ado, I want to introduce Antoine Dill, and normally we'd all give him a warm applause. Uh, it's more awkward online, alas, but yes, Anna, thank you for, for clapping. Okay, so Antoine, yeah, you have uh, the floor. We can, we can do it like this, yeah? That's ah, that works, that works. <laughs> Antoine, okay. you have the floor, and um, yeah. you know, in about half an hour, I'll give you a sign so that we can move on to the Q&A. Okay. Um, shall I share the screen right away, or, yeah? Yes, please. Okay, let's do that. Okay. One moment. Okay, class. Thank you very much for the um, for the good introduction. Um, I always start off my lectures and my presentations by um, introducing myself and um, the social context, basically where I'm from. So I was born in, in Suriname and I, I've been raised by my grandmother, by my mother and father, by my aunts, by my uh, uncles. So it, it's really a village, you know, that, that, that raises a, a child in, in Suriname. And when I was four years, I moved with my uh, parents uh, to the Netherlands. And maybe uh, many of you know that uh, Suriname was a former colony of the Netherlands. Um, and the earliest memory that I have uh, as a child is my grandmother working in her garden, tending to the trees and to the flowers and also to the food crops. And I was sitting there uh, looking at her and um, she many times said to me, uh, Antoine, my love, um, um, Mother Earth gives us so much, but we should also take care of her, we should also take care of Mother Earth. And that is something that, that she um, also, of course, through an oral uh, tradition, uh, learned from her uh, parents. And this um, philosophy or this um, ethics of reciprocity is very important for indigenous culture. So everything you do with the Earth, what you take, you also have to give something back. 
And I think that that's a very um, important uh, way of living. My uh, motto in life uh, is you know, tracing ancestral footprints for decolonized futures. And futures is, is, is not just one futures, but there are many futures possible depending on the location where you are. Um, and um, also important uh, is that if I say tracing ancestral footprints in many in, in, in indigenous cultures, the, the past or the history is right in front of us, right in front of us, because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. Um, we learn from them, we take guidance from them, and, um, and that kind of guides us to, to a future that is not linear, but can go different ways. And if you compare that, how we have been raised, and me myself also here uh, as, as, a, as a chemical engineer here in the West, we tend to think in a linear way of development, leaving the past behind, always looking forward. And um, I mentioned this be because it's very important if you uh, uh, would like to understand different narratives or different ways how we can imagine, imagine uh, different futures. So if I look right in front of me, if I look to history and um, where we are at today here in the world, uh, in a state of emergency, um, with a climate disruption, climate change, uh, racial tensions uh, and issues, all the refugees, then um, it, 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 it comes from somewhere. It just didn't start it uh, yesterday. So it is my strong belief and opinion that if we want to move forward and save our planet, then we have to look uh, uh, to the future. Um, this is a slide of, um, it's a painting of, the, uh, of John uh, Gast. He's an, an, an American uh, painting. And it kind of summarizes the way of thinking how progress looks like. And this is kind of, in a nutshell, the, the European uh, uh, colonial uh, project. You see in the center, we have um, uh, uh, an heavenly white uh, a woman who bears in her uh, uh, hands an innovative uh, uh, telegraph wire in her hand. And the main argument is that basically the native uh, Indians in North America were primitive. And the, the white colonists were there to bring civilization uh, to the new world, to yeah, establish a new world order. At that time, I'm, I'm talking about uh, around 1492 when Columbus uh, set foot on uh, the Americas, there was no Europe. Um, there were no indigenous people. There were no uh, uh, black people, there were no Asian people. You only had local tribes and local communities. And this is a very important date, 1492, for, for us and for, for Europe and for a uh, whole um, humankind, because that's when, um, let's say, um, it was the start actually of uh, ecocide, it was the start of, um, um, yeah, extractivism. It was the start also of uh, uh, a massive genocide. Um, as we see here, the native uh, people are on the run and also the, 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 the bisons, the bisons, the buffaloes are on the run. And um, I think in two centuries from, from, from the, uh, let's say 1492 till the 18th century, it's estimated that around 30 million Native Americans have been massacred. Um, an astounding uh, number of uh, buffaloes, it, it's also in the order of 40 million have been killed. And it was also the uh, establishment of the plantation economy, as we call it. So basically monoculture uh, of crops. So this is kind of the start of the European, uh, uh, the European project. And it was all done with the Bible in the hand, with the, the true belief that we 
as Europeans were bringing civilization to the world, not even knowing that when they landed in the Americas um, and when they looked at the, the, what they call the wilderness, these were very sophisticated um, tended permacultures where people lived in harmony um, and together with, the na with, with, with nature. So that's very important to bear in mind where did this all started and where should we go from now? So what is the European colonial uh, 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 legacy? Um, to fully understand it, you have to know, um, you know, what is the philosophical basis of a society because that, that largely determines the culture, the social constructs, the politics, the economics, and kind of shapes the way we place ourselves in the universe and how we also treat other people and the nature around us. If we look at Western society, it's partly based on the legacy of philosophers like uh, René Descartes, uh, who we all know from Je pense, donc je suis. I think, therefore I am. And this proposition places a strong emphasis on the individual and puts the self and own thinking or the thinking of my country, of my culture, it, it, it puts it first. If we compare that, for example, um, with the Ubuntu uh, philosophy of the Bantu peoples in South uh, Africa, where the emphasis is on the universal bond that connects humanity and all living beings on the earth, then you can summarize the Ubuntu proposition as I am because we are, we are because you are. In the Ubuntu, you become a person through others and by acknowledging the, the other in their uniqueness and being different. So there is no us or them and my humanity is not embedded in me as an individual or uh, in a country, but my humanity is created and sustained through interactions with the universe, the earth, the animals and everything around us. So the I am is fluid and dynamic and continues to unfold, is, is a part of being in the universe. And we tend to think that, that, that native cultures or, or indigenous people, um, let's say are, are, are primitive, but they have been thousands of years developing, developing and developing. And it, it, those are not static cultures. Also many in influential uh, European enlightenment uh, philosophers such as uh, Voltaire, Hegel and Kant, who form the, the, the basis of Western thinking, they had very racist ideas about the African continent and cultures with, without ever being there. So their mindset boiled down to that the white race um, is being uh, superior and a measure of all things. That's why we also have right now a, a, a single narrative, um, a single uh, uh, a framework of looking at things from a Eurocentric point of view. And um, the, um, you know, if, I, if I fast forward, um, let's say to 2020, um, and, and here we are in, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest and the, the killing of George Floyd, and um, yeah, who, who actually with his last breath that he exhaled fueled the uprising worldwide against what I call the neo-colonial and let's say uh, uh, capitalist ideology. And um, the, the, and I think it's important to mention it because later on I will kind of weave in the, the whole climate disruption with also, with also development of uh, slavery and, and, and racism. Um, for example, also the, the religious philosopher William Durham was part of the uh, clergy in, in his time in 1713. Um, in his book, Physical uh, Theology, Theology um, he states that we, yeah, as Europeans, we can plunder the whole world penetrate to the bowels of the earth, descend to the deepest bottom uh, of the earth and travel to the farthest shores to amass riches. Basically a saying that nature 
uh, is there uh, uh, to be common commoditized by 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 uh, yeah by humanity and um, so Western civilization is rooted in this context and tradition of thought, which has led to uh, uh, yeah, the, the capitalist society and to the colonial economic system uh, based on the plantation uh, economy, exploitation and uh, the domination and delusions actually of superior, superiority over, over other cultures and mother earth. And the, the consequences we are we are living right now are enormous. Um, if we look at debt and destruction of indigenous peoples, uh, the transatlantic traffic of enslaved Africans and slavery in the East, also the Holocaust, what was a part of this, this mindset and the, the genocide of many First Nation people in, in different countries, uh, the Aboriginals in Australia or the Hereros in, in uh, Na Namibia. And, um, you know, although it doesn't happen on, on, a, on a large scale anymore, um, as was done by the Dutch uh, VOC and uh, WIC, yeah, those companies and those uh, are no longer here. But if we kind of uh, uh, do a, 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 a good an analysis, then we can see that you know, the, 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 the Dutch VLC that they have found worthy replacements in multi multinationals uh, such as Shell or Unilever or Monsanto, at least that, that, that's, that's my belief and opinion, because they are taking the, the colonial inhuman project to the next level actually. And the brutalization of Mother Earth through large scale mining, oil drilling, deforestation and pollution of waterways and air, um, primarily in the former uh, uh, colonies, it continues unabated. It, it still goes on. And the resulting climate dis disruption is the flip side of, of one and the same colonial currency that has spawned racism and also gender uh, inequality. So um, to summarize, um, Western prosperity, and, and, and freedom and the way of life that, that, that we're celebrating right now here in, in, in our Western uh, cultures uh, and uh, democracy um, is, is literally built on genocide and permeated with blood and tears of erased and oppressed cultures. And, um, and it still uh, 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 continues. So I think it's very important um, when we, um, you know, march uh, through the streets, you know, uh, uh, for a, a better climate, yeah, when we go to the, the climate marches, it, it's important to think who or what are we fighting for? Are we fighting for a green economy, for a, 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 a CO2 tax um, to achieve the Paris climate goals? that by the way, don't think, take into account the, um, the impact uh, of the global south, but is basically the, the 1.5, uh, uh, let's say max of uh, uh, increase in temperature is beneficial for <laughs> us here uh, in, 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 in European countries, but not for the global south. Um, so, I think we should keep that in mind and um, we should think of different ways to kind of solve the way out of this, this, this climate disruption and the way of thinking. So I think we need uh, different narratives, uh, a different uh, uh, um, philosophy basis. And, um, and I also think that, that people as, 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 as you young people in University of Delft, I mean, you have the gift of technology and it is very important to think how can I use this, this te technology in a very beneficial way that would benefit all of humankind, all of the earth um, and not just us here uh, in the West. So, 
in this sense, I think we can learn a lot from indigenous cultures that, that live for thousands of years in symbiosis and harmony with nature, inspired by their uh, philosophy of life that, that is reflected, for example, uh, also in, in the Oromo uh, community in Ethiopia, where they have developed a very interesting uh, uh, ethics um, regarding uh, the environment and also co cosmology. And I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later on. But um, what I wanted to, to uh, establish first is yeah, what is the colonial legacy and where did we come from? And who is actually responsible for the terrible situation that we are in right now? And, um, and we're not out of the reach yet, yet. Because if we think about a colonial, colonial legacy, we think about you know, uh, land grabbing, displacement of cultures, murder, genocide, ecocide, monoculture, uh, a single narrative. There's no room for other uh, 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 narratives uh, other than the, the, the Western uh, narrative. And it goes on. So as an example, and I can, can give many, many, many examples, is um, for example, the, the deforestation that, that's going on right now in, in Maluku and West Papua. And those are former Dutch colonies um, in uh, Indonesia. And um, Maluku uh, uh, exists of thousands of small islands with different indigenous cultures that, that, that lived, lived there for thousands of years. And um, right now there are massive deforestations and displacement of the, the local population uh, going on. And that, that also goes hand in hand with, um, let's say the murder and killing of people who stand up and, and, and turn into activists and to prevent this. Um, and this is all is done to uh, support the establishment of uh, millions of acres of palm oil uh, plantations um, yeah, to, to support the biofuels industry, uh, our diesel cars, and also as, as uh, part for the food industry. So these are the, the big agricultural and oil companies that uh, have a stake uh, in, in, in the Maluku and West Papua. Um, and it's also being uh, uh, financed by uh, yeah, the, 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 the well-known banks here in the, in, in, in the Netherlands, the financial institutions. So it, it's a really dire, life-threatening situation right now. And there are a couple of uh, activists uh, that I work uh, closely with um, that are change, uh, trying to change that narrative and, and stop basically the, the, the massive killing of Mother Earth and um, the local population. Um, I, I would recommend you to, to, to watch um, uh, Brian Hukom. He's, he's an activist from the Maluku and he made an, uh, an interesting uh, uh, film um, uh, called Beschermen ons Oerwaal, so protect our rainforest, where he kind of explains what's going on right now in, 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 his, uh, yeah, in his country basically. So, so moving on, I also wanted to um, kind of talk about the, the, the Niger Delta and the oil spills in the Oconee Nine. I'm not sure if you um, if you you heard about the Oconee Nine in uh, Nigeria, um, but it's also a, a, a gut wrenching uh, story. Um, in in southern uh, in southern Nigeria, the Okoni people have seen firsthand the violence of big oil. Shell started operations uh, in the region in the late 1950s. And over the, the decades that followed, more than 30 billion of oil were extracted from the region. Um, unfortunately, the majority of the people saw little benefit from the billions of dollars of profits that were made from Ogoni oil. And um, the plunder of its resources and the degradation of the environment that followed have devastated uh, Oconi land and undermined the traditional livelihoods of, of communities that, that have been also displaced on, 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 on a massive scale. And um, 
nine of those activists and, and, and protesters were um, executed. Nine leaders uh, of the protest movement were executed by the Nigerian government on November 10th in 1995. And, um, and this was done on trumped up charges that didn't even make any sense. But the Nigerian government is, is of course, um, yeah, protecting you know the 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 the, the, the stakes of uh, Dutch Royal Shell uh, uh, in Nigeria, and it's also making a lot of money uh, of that. Um, and and we need to see the the, the killing and the, the devastation of the environment um, in a continuation of the the colonial project. So it's not done yet. It's it's still ongoing. Um, and as we speak, uh, there's uh, uh, a couple of uh, widowers of the uh, massacred uh, protesters are uh, still um, engaged in a lawsuit against Shell and also against the Nigerian uh, uh, government to um, yeah, to seek uh, justice. Um, and if, if we also look at the devastating oil spills in the, in the Niger Delta over the past five decades, it will probably, uh, those are estimates of the, the United Nation, it, it will probably cost $1 billion to kind of uh, uh, clean that up. And it will take many, 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 many decades for the environment to kind of recover. Um, so the, the Nigerians and the Oconi people have paid a, a high price for the economic growth uh, of, of us here in, in, in the West and for the economic growth of the shareholders of Shell. So though those two um, examples um, are just two of many stories you, you can tell. You can go to South America or you can go to India or to the African continent and the, 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 the mechanisms and the, the stories are, are, are one and the same. Um, if we look at the earth defenders, because we call this, this, these, these activists, and these indigenous peoples, they tend to, to our mother earth. They are the, the, the true defenders of the earth. And, um, and many of them are being killed. I, I think it's an estimate that five to six earth defenders are, are killed every week as we speak. And um, the latest figures I have is from uh, 2018 where 321 earth defenders uh, and primarily indigenous environmental activists you know, were killed by local governments or by local militia. And quite often they work together with the big uh, Western multinationals that I uh, just, just mentioned. So, you know, this is also uh, for me a call to action to, to everyone and, and to, to raise awareness of this. Maybe you already know this. But um, because it's so far away from our world, you know, we, we, we don't think about this on, 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 on a daily basis, but it's going on. So the front lines of climate disruption and climate change, um, there are already many people uh, dying there. So what I also think is, is important to not just talk about those people, but I also, also wanted to, to show their names and, um, and kind of uh, um, also ask you or, or any other people, um, you know, these are people we should think about and, and talk about and keep, also keep in our mind um, when we're busy, when we're busy um, trying to design uh, or imagine, you know, a, a, a new future. Um, so these are uh, uh, some of the names that you can see. It, it happens all over, all over the world as we speak. Um, this is 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 a slide because I also wanted to kind of talk about. Um, sustainability and corporate sustainability. So what, what does it actually mean? Can I interrupt you for just a second? Because we have about 10 minutes left. Okay, yeah, okay. that's fine, that's fine. 
Um, because I've been working for 25 years, so I've been educated as a chemical engineer, and my focus was on uh, designing, um, let's say, uh, uh, sustainable industrial processes when it comes to water management, energy management, and raw material use. And I've worked uh, in many countries, um, in India, China, Mexico, um, those, those what we call developing countries to help them um, in certain areas to implement integrated resource uh, management uh, projects. And actually, I, I worked for Nalco company at that time. And I also worked together with, with local companies like Shell, uh, Unilever or Nestle that were also part uh, of the uh, environment uh, in, in, in those countries. And um, what I actually learned that corporate sustainability, <laughs> to put it bluntly, is just a, 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 is just a tool. Um, the, the main driver still is um, making a profit, period. And um, so if we talk here in the West about uh, sustainability and everything we're doing and the, the Paris Agreement, the association that gets in my head is, is like the Titanic. And uh, we are kind of the, 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 the orchestra that is playing a nice tune and we're, we're heading uh, 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 towards uh, uh, the iceberg. That's actually my association when, when uh, I hear the term uh, sustainability or corporate sustainability. And to make a link with um, the donut economy, I think um, because I was uh, part of one of the first working groups here in Amsterdam, I think it's a year and a half or two years ago when Kate Rayward uh, came here uh, with her uh, project to kind of um, comment uh, on, on, on the donut economy. And I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting model. And I love the way she also incorporated um, the fact that you also have to look at the impact of your uh, design, you know, abroad. What does it do to indigenous uh, uh, countries? That is actually something I brought in. And um, on the other hand, the, the, the constructive criticism I have, it's, it, it's again a model that will work within the exi existing system. And as you know, the existing si system, this neoliberal uh, system, yeah, it, it um, exists just to make profit. And, um, and one other thing I would like to see added to um, the donut economy model is the ethics of uh, reciprocity. So everything we do, if we take something uh, from nature, we also have to give something back. And another point I wanna make is that we should start to think local only use local resources. Stop importing the resources from um, the global south. Then you are being truly a circular and then you are re really trying to make a change. So those are the, the things I wanna add uh, regarding um, the donut economy. I wish I had more time, but a an, an, an very important uh, uh, part of this lecture is that what I would like you to, um, what I would like uh, encourage to you is to in your um, let's say uh, a study in education I was educated in a very tech technocratic technical way and there was no room for other narratives and I think right now that there's a there's a whole field being discovered that's been there for thousands of years and what is called traditional um, ecological uh, design um, and, and that, that's a, a different body of knowledge. It's a different way of knowing and wisdom. And it's, it's another narrative that has potential sign significance to contemporary science and policy. And, um, and that traditional ecological knowledge resides with many indigenous cultures all over the world from Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Traditional ecolo ecological knowledge refers to the, the knowledge practice and belief concerning the relationship of living beings to one another and to the physical environment. Um, and this knowledge and wisdom and way of knowing is born from 
a long intimacy and attentiveness to a, a homeland and can arise wherever people or are materially but also spiritually integrated with their surroundings and, and landscape. And uh, traditional, traditional ecological um, knowledge is being recognized as having equal status with Western scientific knowledge by the United Nations Environmental Program. And it was also, was, was also termed the intellectual twin to Western society. And the, the, the scope of traditional eco, ecological knowledge includes detailed empirical knowledge of population, biology, resources, assessment and monitoring, um, successional dynamics, patterns of fluctuation in climate and resources, species interaction, sustainable harvesting, and adaptive uh, management. And um, this, this knowledge is much more than empirical information concerning uh, ecological relationships. You know, on, and unlike, unlike Western science, traditional knowledge is woven into and is inseparable from the social and spiritual uh, context of the, cult, of the culture and the land and the surroundings that you are in. Um, and I truly believe that this, this knowledge rivals Western uh, science as a body of empirical information. But um, in addition, traditional knowledge also extends its explanatory power beyond the strictly uh, empirical where Western science actually cannot go because it's very rational the way we are uh, being taught and educated um, at the universities. Um, one other point I want to make about traditional ecological uh, design and knowledge is that it, it's rich and laden with associated values where relationships between different things are very important and give you a lot of information. While we here, and myself included, while we here in the West, we pride ourselves on data that, that are value free, as we call it and where nature is viewed strictly uh, objectively. Um, and one uh, other important thing I wanna make about traditional ecological design is that it, it also includes an ethic of reciprocal respect and obligations between humans and the non-human world. Um, because in many indigenous science and, 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 and philosophy, Nature is the subject, it's not the object, as it is here in, in Western uh, science. And such holistic ways of knowing and of understanding the environment offer, offers many alternatives to the dominant consumptive values of our Western uh, societies. And important to note as well is that globally indigenous peoples, they inhabit areas where 80% of the Earth's biodiversity is located right now, and that, and that is left. And for thousands of years, they have been the guardians and protectors of, of the Earth and of Mother Earth. Um, so I think to, to move forward our society and, and, and save Mother Earth, I believe that we should include traditional ec ecological knowledge in our transition to the circular, circular economy. Um, and as you know, a basic tenet of biology is that diversity is the raw material of evolution. Without adequate diversity, adaptation to changing environments is not possible and extinction is likely uh, uh, to, to occur. Um, so similarly, I think that intellectual uh, uh, diversity and different narratives fuels the evolution of, of our cultures and our ability to adapt to a changing world. So the adoption of a single mode, a single narrative of thinking based on a Cartesian and materialistic view of nature has really contributed to the degradation of the environment that's happening right now. Um, I have a couple of uh, uh, examples here, what, what I brought in. Antoine, can I interrupt you for a second? Because we're already at the end of our allotted time. Okay. 
Yes. We're going to go over time with the Q&A as well. Um, so I, I'll, I'll wrap up in 30 seconds. Cool, thank you. I had a couple of uh, examples of extraordinary uh, uh, design and uh, engineering practices. This is the Machu Picchu in, uh, it's the Inca Citadel in Southern uh, Peru that was built in the 15th century. And uh, the mastery uh, over agriculture without using uh, fertilizers or other destructive chemicals was, was truly amazing, a wonder. Um, and I would like to recommend Low-Tech Design by Radical Indigenism by Julia Watson. It, it's a book that contains a lot of information and examples about traditional e ecological design. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you, though. Uh, Anton, that was a very quick uh, wrap up. Um, okay, we've gone over time. Just a quick note, if you do need to take your break or go on to a workshop or whatever else, we understand if you have to go. But um, I have time. I definitely have questions for Antoine. I hope you guys do have as well. Um, so Antoine, you just told us about the impact of colonial history on today's global crises. And I, I'm like the plural crises, not just the climate change, but uh, social problems, cultural problems, um, economic problems as well. And even, even the Dutch role in that, that was very interesting to hear about. And of course, the ongoing struggles, you mentioned the Ogoni in the Niger Delta, uh, uh, Indonesian islands that are being uh, extracted all their resources. Mm -hmm. And of course, finally, the importance of hearing their voices mm -hmm. and not just their stories, you know, mediated through uh, sustainable corporate narratives, but directly from the source. So I have some practical questions, which I'll get to later about how, how do we hear from these people? Mm -hmm. And how do we incorporate their cultural values, uh, you know, in Delft, for example, or wherever we go to work in the future. But first, I want to turn to our visitors today. So if you could end the share screen, then uh, we can see each other. We can see everybody again. We have questions in the chat. Very important question, and and what I what I immediately picked up is that you said it, it it's a train that cannot be stopped. Um, here in the Netherlands, a, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, museums uh, have been funded by Shell, by BP, by all those those big corporations, and there's an organization that is called um, Fossil Free Culture. Um, then has been um, doing a lot of uh, uh, protest actions to make um, the museums that are supported by Shell to divest uh, uh, from Shell and with success. So that they, they had a, a, a lot of uh, actions uh, in front of the museums and they did it in a very artsy way. And uh, I know that the Van Gogh Museum is, is, is stopping its, its relation with, with Shell and other uh, companies that are in the extractive uh, uh, industries. And I think um, the University of Amsterdam, if you are a student there, it's also your university. And if you want it to change, I think, you know, take matters in, in, in your own hands and um, connect with, for example, with fossil free culture, but also with, there's also a, a group that's um, um, busy with uh, decolonize uh, the university, so the University of Amsterdam. Um, and so you could connect with, with, with those people and see what kind of action you can take to change the course of this ship that is going in the wrong direction. That is what I would like you to recommend. And if you want me to connect you with with some of those organizations, I'm very pleased to, to do that. And what we can also do, I have the uh, Nature's Narrative platform where I work together with Pakhais de Swijger and where we um, um, uh, uh, discuss and organize all kinds of events around uh, the alternatives um, for the, the destructive path that we're on. And maybe we, we could do something uh, <laughs> about the university. So. You know, Antoine, if you have uh, further information and links to share, I can put those uh, on the website and on Facebook later. Yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we have some questions in the chat as well that I want to get to.
you know, it, it's not that I'm against for-profit companies. What I think is 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 important because we've seen, and I'm sure this this is a is, is a good project when when you explain it uh, the way you just did. Um, we we have seen you know uh, uh, fair trade projects you know uh, in, in in South America and, and on the African continent to kind of support small farmers, and um, we come to the conclusions after what is it 15 years or something that it 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 didn't work, because the big corporations are still grabbing all the land, the small farmers are not making enough money, so it was a drop in a bucket and it didn't change the dynamics. What I think is radical change is that you have to give local people back their land, give, their, give them back autonomy um, so, so they can decide uh, how they want to live. And if they want to live outside, uh, let's say the neoliberal capitalist society and go back to uh, uh, the old ways or again live in communal uh, uh, societies, I think we should give people the choice. And the way we can do that is through restorative justice, meaning that reparations will be needed to fix the uh, environmental destruction, but also to fix um, the, 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 the uh, yeah, let's say the dismal situations and, and poverty that, that, that people are in. So I think that's the way out. Restorative reparations for local people, give them back their autonomy, and we uh, and all the Western companies and, 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 and the West, they need to get out. <laughs> I don't say it's, it's a reality, but I think that's, if you ask me, that is the way forward. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up? Because uh, a lot of what you talked about is you know, cultural values, and it's this very big picture, but I'm also wondering on the practical mm -hmm. level, you are a chemical engineer. You have decades of experience at Naco Company, which is, I believe, a water yes. filtration company, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, what advice would you give for you know, instituting this kind of cultural change in your own company, especially if they're about the bottom line, about profit? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's an... Um... That's a big challenge because you know I, I've lived, uh, uh, I've lived, I've worked in uh, industrial setting and for-profit companies and a, and a big uh, multinational for 25 years. So you know, I, I it's easy for me to talk uh, a different uh, tune right now. But uh, Nalco Company was what was called a sustainability company. So we were helping other companies to become more sustainable. But we were working with the Shells, the Unilevers, with, with, with the big companies. So in a sense, you are also compromised if you help and sustain those, those, those companies. And to come back to your question, what can you do from within? Um, I think as, 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 as a young uh, uh, engineer, I think it's also interested to, to maybe look outside the box or maybe start your own collective of people that think the same way as you think and that want to make a difference. Um, start your own uh, sustainability uh, companies, company, but do it in, in, in a different way, using also traditional eco ecological uh, uh, knowledge. And I'm not... Uh, judging anyone who decides after uh, the study in University of Delft to, to work with Shell or other companies. But the only thing, have in mind that um, you're part of, of, of a legacy of destruction. And uh, also, I mean, you, you cannot change the beast from within because the beast is the beast, if I may call it uh, 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 that way. And, um, you know, a, a, a company like Shell or Unilever, um, they are there to maintain their status quo, to make profit and, 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 to, and to benefit from, um, yeah, from their business models. So, the, yeah, there's no other way I can kind of swing it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's almost impossible to change those companies from from within. 
but like you said, there's power in numbers. So find the others. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and start your own collective with, with all the knowledge that, that, that you learn uh, from uh, technical university, because, you know, I learned a lot, you know, uh, as a chemical engineer uh, um, studying at the University of uh, Amsterdam. And, but, you know, the, 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 the power is combining our way of knowing and seeing in Western society with the traditional ecological knowledge. That's where I see the future and the power. Mm. Well, um, I think we should go on to the last question. A lot of people are, are having to leave because they have to move on to workshops, etc. How can we continue to preserve and harness these differing worldviews to guide our thinking if they are continually and gradually being lost in the face of this you know, Western profit-driven uh, cultural model? Mm -hmm. How can we hold on to that? Yeah, and, and you know, we, we can only do what we can do. You know, as individuals or, or as organizations or as, as, as collectives, uh, etc. But um, through the, the Nature's Narrative program, uh, program I've been talking to uh, many different indigenous uh, uh, people um, from all over the world. And there is a, a trend right now, for example, in North America, but also in Australia or in, in Canada and also in Suriname, where I'm from, that the indigenous cultures that, that have been uh, 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 massacred and, and decimated and where they lost their, their, their livelihood, but also their culture, because they, they, during the colonial period, they weren't allowed to talk their own language. So a lot of knowledge was destroyed. Um, and through modern technology, um, they are being able now to start learning their native languages again. And uh, they are learning about the traditional seeds that have been used by their ancestors. Because, um, for example, in, in, in uh, many Native uh, uh, Americans, they, they suffer from diabetes and from uh, all kinds of diseases because the Western food is not made for their body. And they are in the midst of reclaiming their history and starting to kind of build uh, again their, their own cultures. Um, in in uh, South Dakota, for example, in the reservation there, they're also trying to bring the, the, the buffaloes back. So there are, are herds being, uh, uh, big herds there right now. And we see that all over uh, South America, in North America, but also the Aboriginals. So I do have um, hope that things are changing, but also here in the West, things are changing. We know that we cannot continue the way uh, we have been behaving. And um, I think it, it will take many years, but, but you know, um, everything we do, uh, I always say it's like, you know, you throw a, a, a little pebble, um, you know, in the water, it makes concentric circles and it influences, influences the universe. So also by doing this, by talking to you, um, you know, I, I, I think um, slowly but gradually think things will change. I hope this will, this answers your, your, your question. And um, I know that we're up against a, 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 a tremendous 400, 400 year old system that has been expanding 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 but i think what i call the beast um we are confronting it right now and i think that beast is on its last legs it, it's morally bankrupt it's gasping for air and um and it, it, it's up to us to come up with alternatives thank you anton that's a very positive note to end today's uh, event on.